Welcome to Fearless, Do More, the podcast where we dive into the minds of some extraordinary and fearless businesses and people, people who are challenging the status quo and who are helping to change the world of business around us. I'm your host, Jill Hunter. I'm the managing partner at Square One Law. On each episode, I'll be chatting to innovators, change makers, and trailblazers, where we explore the unique journeys of our guests. We'll delve into the fears they face, the setbacks they've overcome, the lessons they've learned along the way. We'll uncover the secrets behind their resilience and we'll find out what motivates them to keep going, even in the face of adversity. We'll also have a few laughs along the way too. My guests are all leaders who relentlessly pursue their passions, not only to create a better tomorrow, but who inspire us to push our own boundaries, those who fear less and do more. Welcome to our podcast today. Um, I've got a really interesting guest with me again. So we have Peter Neal from the Experience Bank. Peter, welcome. Invite me, I appreciate it. You're welcome. The Experience Bank, that's a brilliant name for a business. Where did that come from? It is a brilliant name and I jealously protect it. Um, I very <laughs> fortunately uh, own the trademark. Um, so the Experience Bank wasn't um, uh, registered by me. It was actually registered by, um, I think it was One North East at the time. It's associated with one of the early Jeremy funds. Uh, one of the early Jeremy funds required a mentor with money, I think they called it. And they needed to create a bank of mentors. And someone came up with the name The Experience Bank and registered it. So it was actually owned by North East Access to Finance at the time. Um, so yeah, we acquired that. And uh, it is a brilliant name for what we do. Um, well, that leads perfectly on to what actually, what actually do you do under that brand? Because I think you do more than one thing. I do. So, uh, so the Experience Bank is an entity that I basically set up in my spare time whilst I was working for other people. At the time, I was working for an entrepreneur called Nigel Wright. Um, but, and whilst working for Nigel, I recognised that there were a number of very early stage businesses, founding entrepreneurs, who were really wrestling with their commercialization journey, um, probably hadn't done it before, um, uh, never built a business plan before, uh, never commercialized a business before, uh, and could really benefit from having access to people who had done that. I found myself being in a position to introduce these founding entrepreneurs with all these people over here. Um, uh, and decided to create a network of these, been there and done it, got as many scars and medals sorts of people, um, create a network of them, and then uh, enable the founding entrepreneurs to access them um, for that kind of wise advice. All these people kind of know how deep the potholes are, how hard the obstacles are, because they've overcome them or avoided them. Um, that's what I mean by the scars, really. Um, uh, and they are extremely valuable for these early stage founding entrepreneurs. And so I've been curating this, the Experience Bank, for well, eight years or more now. There are over 260 people in it. It's a private closed network to protect them from spamming and selling and stuff like that. Um, but what, what is common to them all is that um, they all want to give something back. They're at a stage in their careers now where they have the time availability and the desire to give something back. Um, so they, they, really, they really enjoy interacting with these entrepreneurs and it's completely philanthropic. Absolutely, and I, mean, I think yeah, that's a really part of, a, uh, part of a lot of businesses now is about having a, a purpose beyond profit. How important is, is that to you? So uh, uh, it's... It underpins everything I do now. So I set the Experience Bank up um, eight years ago whilst working for someone else. Um, I continued working for other people for several years until three and a half year, years ago when I um, had the opportunity to set up my own business. Um, uh, so the Experience Bank, when I created it, we, we, uh, we set up a, a company, a social enterprise company, now, alongside that is a commercial revenue business, revenue generating business, and the two entities form the Experience Bank Group, which is the kind of overarching brand, if you like, that I use. So when I took the plunge to set up my own business, 
um, I wanted to be purpose driven. Uh, there are a whole number of reasons for that, really, um, both professional and personal. Um, but having my own business, I was able to uh, uh, develop it as I saw fit and pursue things that really interested me, but very fortunately were found to be of value to my client base. Um, so the commercial revenue generating business needs to generate revenue because I need to you know, uh, uh, maintain a standard of living, et cetera, et cetera, look after my kids and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it also enables us to fund the development of the social enterprise. So we gift 5% of our revenue from the commercial business to the social enterprise so that it has money to invest in PR and marketing and events and things like that and just administer itself generally. And that has enabled the Experience Bank to really push forward and help even more entrepreneurs because when I was doing it, in my spare time working for the people um, that was quite limited now where you know every week I'm chatting to entrepreneurs they might be pointed to me um, by the accelerators or the incubators or word of mouth and we are uh, assembling advisory boards for early stage companies on average once a month now and we've done over 60 so it's very impactful um, um, and provides that purpose um, so yeah it is a purpose-driven business. And I think as well, you know, it, for me it, in business, getting a diversity of view in terms of the decisions that I make for my business about what's what, what's right, what's wrong, um, is, is really important. You know, you make good decisions if you've considered lots of different aspects. So um, when people come in to those businesses, they, they'll be doing that. How are you nurturing sort of future talent as well? Hmm. So diversity plays a fundamental part of what we do. So what I should have told you was what the commercial business does because it's they are inextricably linked. So my, the Experience Bank Group is interested in the quality of boards and senior management teams for privately owned businesses and charities in the northeast of England. Um, I could have set out to build a recruitment business, but I chose not to. I chose to focus purely on the board level and the senior management level and then work out ways of adding even more value to a company's board and its performance. So we do find um, board directors, non-exec directors and trustees and executive directors. Um, we also do governance audits and board effectiveness reviews and we also have a leadership development side of the business. All of which um, inherently promotes diversity um, um, when we're asked to find uh, a new director of a board, inevitably, we're looking at the diversity of that board and how it can be improved. The leadership development side of the business is all about developing a pool of talent to become great board directors. Um, a particular uh, program within that leadership development is our non-exec director, board advisor, trustee, peer group program. And as the name suggests, it's all about um, developing what I found early on was that and not many privately owned businesses had recognized the value of building out a board with independent non-exec directors. But when they did realize there was value, they find it hard to find them or find the right one. You know, historically, it was kind of, uh, you know, who's your mate at the golf course or you know, ask your accountant or whatever. And I think people have progressed beyond that now and have started to appreciate the benefit of really good cognitive diversity in their boardroom. Sounds to me like you're wearing lots of different hats there. I do. How do you manage to, to juggle those, those different hats and decide which one you're going to wear at any point in time? Yeah, so uh, there are a number of hats with the Experience Bank group, of course, but I also am a board director, trustee at the Great North Airments, have been for a while, and that's been a fantastic journey uh, developing its board. Um, and I'm also board advisor for several earlier stage businesses as well. So I do wear quite a lot of hats. Um, but they're hats that I've, I've chosen to wear. I think that's the difference. I'm, with it being my own business, I can choose what I want to do for whom and when. That was a fundamental necessity when I stopped working for someone and wanted to set up my own business. Um, uh, so, and it makes it easier to juggle them when you are naturally interested, committed, 
you know, excited and passionate about what's underneath each of those hats is uh, it, it makes it easier to juggle them. But yeah, it can it can get busy from time to time. So in amongst all of the things that you do, um, in five words, tell me what you like best. Five words. Five words. People. Um, helping. Collaboration. Um, there's three. Um, just having fun. Uh, and this is a little bit of a cliche, but uh, way back when I worked for Nigel, Nigel Wright, he was quite amused one day when we were reflecting on on uh, how people were enjoying working for Nigel Wright. Because, you know, it, recruitment generally is quite hard work, and especially when you go through cycles of recession, it can get quite tough. And I, and I, I, I just happened to mention, well, so long as, you know, at Christmas time I can look back in the year and say I've had net fun, <laughs> then that's a good one. And he, he kept using that um, uh, thereafter. But fun, I think, you know, it's got to be fun. You know, life's too short. Absolutely, absolutely. Which brings me on to, you know, you talked earlier about um, the impact of personal and business. And I, you know, I personally think the two are inextricably linked and you can learn in your personal life from business and, and vice versa. Uh, you know, unfortunately, you've, you've had some pretty tough stuff to go through personally. What, what has that taught you about business? Um. It didn't teach me so much about business. It taught me more about myself, actually, and what I wanted out of life, which inevitably involved quite a lot of business, at least for a few years anyway. So yeah, um, um, uh, the, the events that led up to that shift in my mindset were unfortunately my wife contracted um, cancer. She battled really um, hard against it for several years but you know ultimately it sort of overwhelmed her um and that that kind of event and I, you know everyone has these things to deal with during their life i get that but it, they do tend to make you not just pause you just stop all of a sudden and think you know what what is going on here i had two kids which i know one being a, uh, a teenage daughter which was a interesting uh, journey we've been on but it pauses you to reflect um, and decide how you want to spend your time and for what purpose. Um, and I was so lucky to be able to, at about the same time, um, flip from being an employee to setting up my own business, knowing that I would have revenue coming in pretty quickly. So it was fairly low risk for me, but what it meant was I could be extremely agile with my time. And as I said, you know, choose to spend it doing what I enjoyed doing and got fun from. I was lucky because I've been doing this a very long time, fairly well known for what I do in the region. So it wasn't like I was setting up from scratch needing to find customers and work out ways of adding value. So I, I was privileged in that respect. Um, but it, it was um, it enabled me to you know, look after myself first and foremost, which then enabled me to look after the kids and everyone else in the family, to be honest with you. Um, and actually, you know, looking back, because that was four years ago now nearly, um, uh, I, think, I think it's been, uh, whilst, whilst what caused it was clearly fairly traumatic for lots of people, it, it, we're all in a good place now um, uh, because of, you know, uh, having a different mindset. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's great to hear. I, did, I, I agree. I think sometimes when you go through things together... Mm. And you tackle challenges together it, it brings you together and you're a stronger team at the end of it whether that's work or or at home um you mentioned the word fun again there it's obviously really important to you so forget business and forget forget work what 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 do you what do you do for fun outside of work uh yeah so um there was several years where there wasn't much fun clearly as you can gather um uh, and indeed, for a little while afterwards, it was a case of working out how to have fun again. But, you know, surrounded by brilliant family, some great friends. Um, I, I met someone who had been through a very similar situation to me a year or two earlier. And we found that we had shared common interests. Um, uh, she was particularly into, into music and reading and film and enjoys a bottle of wine and likes a good meal so that that's 
that's how I find myself relaxing. You know, at the weekends is um, you know, going out with Dee for something to eat, or go and see a show, or whatever. Um, that's great. Um, I run a bit. I used to run loads. Um, uh, you know, crazy ultra running. Believe it or not, I don't. I don't look like a runner, but I discovered that I could run slowly for ages. <laughs> Um, and then found that there were there were races you could do all over some really interesting places and mountains and stuff that which was good great fun. Um, I don't do that anymore. Uh, uh, my my running is kind of you know before work in the morning, just keeping the legs t- ticking over. But you know that's um, it's quite therapeutic to get out. I'm quite I'm also very comfortable with my own company. Yeah, you know, I suppose that's inevitable when I spend all day every day talking to people. It's quite nice to just unwind. Um, so running allows me to do that. So that whole ultra thing, is that where people run in the dark and up huge mountains? And yeah, you know it's, that? It, is, it is bonkers, <laughs> really. Um, What's the most extreme one that you've either been involved in or witnessed and thought, no, that's too far for me? One I did, <laughs> the hardest one I did, which wasn't the longest, but it was, it was in the Pyrenees and that was... Um, I think it was 120 kilometers or something like that. Um, uh, that was ultra Pyrenee. That was that was hard. <laughs> uh, actually, I don't mind going up. Coming down off the side of a mountain for hours and hours and hours at a time, it's hard. It hurts your legs and you're knackered because you do it through the night. The longest I did was was called the Lakeland 100, and as the name suggests, it's 100 miles. Race directors in the ultra running community are quite evil people <laughs> they market it as 100 miles and actually make you run 105 um which is <laughs> so that last five miles is a bit of a challenge um that was through the night um i mean it was great fun i uh i started running to avoid losing fitness and i had kids to want to be active with and i just needed to find something to do that I could fit around work. So, you know, 5K runs and stuff like that was easy. And then I sort of got drawn into this trail running and I did the Kilda Marathon and then sucked into this ultra running. It, so it became not so much about fitness, it's about can I do it? Um, and uh, it was hard work preparing for it, but I was I still get a lot of satisfaction from remembering that I could do that. Because it is, you know, it's, it's not pleasant. <laughs> I, I, you know, why would anyone choose to do that? You know, after about seven hours, it starts to become really quite unpleasant. And you've got another 23 to go, so. Gosh. Yes, I mean, that definitely, you know, illustrates to me how we all have a different idea about what fun is. <laughs> but you know what? When I got into it, I suddenly realised that there were loads of people who are kind of closet ultra runners as well. <laughs> Uh, and, it, and it's become quite popular now. And, you know, those endurance events have become... You get loads of people doing triathlons, loads and loads, but there are actually quite a few who do the crazy long runs as well. The other thing about it is it gets you out in some beautiful places. So, you know, whilst you might be feeling rotten, running as the sun rises over a mountain is amazing. You know, it's quite, it is quite therapeutic as well. So you're not, but you're not doing that anymore. So <laughs> no. where, where, where are you looking now for your inspiration and your challenge? Um, what sort of things are you doing instead? So I think my inspiration and challenge really comes from my kids. So uh, uh, Thomas is my eldest. He's 22 this year. He's halfway through a med- medical degree at Newcastle Med School. Um, he just decided he was interested in that area but with the events surrounding his mom he just decided I'm gonna go on be a medic you know go on, go on try and be a doctor um, so set his mind to it I've never seen anyone so committed to passing the exam and the interview as he um, and he did and so he's he's on his way now and he's thoroughly enjoying it hope it's a bit younger she's 17 um, she's doing her A-levels at the moment but she is also moving into a more health and caring uh, career, I suspect. She, she, she's more vocational than, than Thomas. Um, he's, he was a little bit more academic. But watching them work out what they want to do um, 
is both inspiring and challenging. Um, just you know, making sure that they are able to pursue what they want to do. Um, I think that's where I get my motivation, inspiration from. There is also uh, another part of the business that is is exciting and giving me inspiration at the moment, and that's our Future Leaders Peer Group Program, which is something that um, I launched a year ago, uh, aimed at middle managers in organisations uh, for whom their employers uh, regard as you know, um, uh, high potential future leaders, future senior leadership team members, future executive directors, and are looking ways to accelerate their development and the individuals themselves are ambitious to achieve that. Um, and peer group programs are really, really effective ways of uh, enabling people to, to achieve more than they thought they could. Um, you know, the power of peers is well known, isn't it? Um, so um, we launched that, uh, quickly established uh, a cohort, suddenly realized that actually there could be 10, 20, 30 cohorts um, and I just didn't have the resources all the time to be able to um, drive that and administer it. Um, so I needed a, uh, a partner um, to help with that um, and uh, started chatting to Jackson Hogg, who themselves have built, I don't know, I think it's probably a 10, 12 million turnover business now in what seems no time at all. Uh, Richard and Anthony, the co-founders, are people, are two people I know well because I've worked with them for quite a long time at Nigel Wright. So they've grown this tremendous business, very energetic, still scaling, doing a lot of things in the talent solution space. So the Future Leaders program sits really nicely alongside what they do. They're having the right sort of conversations with the right sort of people. So they, they are effectively going to be the engine to uh, get this into a bigger market quicker. So that true that's that's my one thing that has been truly entrepreneurial for me starting it from scratch working out what the market would want what what problem we were solving and then finding a means of distributing it and getting it scaled up that's been good fun but i couldn't have done that i don't think without the existence of advisors that I'd surround, all the people in the experience bank, the people in my non-exec director peer group program, they are all there looking to help. Uh, and I suddenly found themselves offering to help me, um, which has been brilliant. Some of them have been tremendously supportive. But yeah, that's a, I think I used the word collaborative and refined. Since, well, during the pandemic, I found people being naturally more helpful and collaborative. Uh, Post-pandemic, uh, I've seen that wane a little bit, unfortunately. Some people have reverted to type, I think. But most are still in that, you know, we're in this together. Let's be successful together. Let's stop worrying about what our competitors are doing. Let's start working out how we might complement or collaborate. Um, which, which is refreshing because back in the world of recruitment, certainly 10, 15 years ago, there's very little of that. You know, it's, it's all about uh, competition, worrying about what your competitors are doing. Um, I think maybe the world's moved on a bit. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, we, it's very similar in the, in the legal profession. But in terms of collaboration, I, I, I think it is. Um, for, a, a gr for a growing number of businesses, it's really important to find the right partner. Um, and a lot of that, to do with the chemistry between you. What, what do you think the keys to, to a successful collaboration are? Oh, shared value set, without a shadow of a doubt. I mean, I knew instantly that Richard and Anthony and I thought the same, uh, um, shared the same values, had the same view when it comes to you know, employee engagement, customer engagement, um, uh, relationship-driven uh, activities. So, you know, we taught the same language and thought the same way immediately. Um, uh, and very, very fortunate for me, they had a business of sufficient scale by then to to be able to contemplate partnering with me and launch and you know helping us drive the the peer group program, but you know um, and having the the distribution channels. So it's a match made in heaven, hopefully. Great.
<laughs> early days. Well, yeah. we'll see, but I'm, I'm I'm sure it will be. Um, we have a bit of a sort of saying at, at Square One Law, which is, um, you know, a mistake's only a mistake if you don't learn from it. And I'm always interested to hear about things that perhaps haven't gone as well as you had hoped and what um, and what you learned from it. Yeah, I suspected you were going to ask me that. I, I have been <laughs> thinking about that. And, you know, there's, there's I've done loads, loads and loads of mistakes. Um, and I, I struggle to find one in particular that would be a good example. I, I think... Um, a mistake that I still make from time to time is um, uh, not listening to my inner voice. Um, I, I am getting much better if my inner voice is telling me, whoa, pause, don't say that, don't press send on that email, just leave it for a bit. Um, uh, I always find that the outcome is better when I, when I listen to it. But yeah, I, you know, I think I have been quick to react or judge in business situations. I still have a, I do do that occasionally, I did it the other day, um, but I'm much better at recognizing that and doing something about it. So it's, it's, it's um, not so much a specific mistake as, a, as, a, as a, a characteristic that I need to be watchful of. So we've covered quite a lot of ground there. You know, you've 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 um, you've had an interesting career and an interesting business journey that's taken you through lots of different paths. You've obviously had a, an interesting, well, that's the right word. Per, you know, from a personal point of view, as well. Um, what's next? So all of this that I've that I'm trying to do now has. Uh, two principal objectives. First of all is to get the kids up and running and independent and feeling fulfilled with whatever they choose to do. And I've got, I think, maybe five or six more years of focusing on that before they're probably in that situation. Thomas might be a bit sooner than Hope um, because she's younger. Um, And the other thing is I have a a dream. It's It's not so much a dream. I I will make this happen. But I really want to go and be able to spend half my time in Italy. Fantastic. Um, uh, I've thought about should that mean buying somewhere in Italy or, I mean, Brexit hasn't helped, has it? Because at the moment we have to come back after 90 days. But but now I'm thinking, well, no, actually the 90 days is probably not bad. I I could go on, because you can go and get long-term lets Mm. um, quite easily. and as long as they've got you know good broadband, good Wi-Fi, I can still do a bit of work. Um, so yeah, I, I'm I'm hopeful that I I am able to go and nick off to Italy, follow the sunshine a bit for longer periods of time. I'll never give up my home uh, here in Newcastle, um, but I'd like to be able to oscillate, spend you know half my time in Italy. I just love Italy. I love the people, I love the food, I love the wine. Uh, Dee really enjoys that as well, and she and I are uh, are trying to learn Italian. Please don't ask me to say <laughs> um, uh, we're still learning, but that's good fun. Um, uh, and the intervening years, before that actually can happen, uh, we're looking forward to going and doing some recce trips there every year. So, yeah, sort of, I don't imagine ever retiring as such, but being able to be even more selective about what I do and being able to do that whilst in a in a nice you know townhouse or whatever around the corner from the piazza in Italy somewhere would be perfect. Well I think that's a fabulous note to end on um I you know wish you every success in that journey and uh, I hope you do get to follow the sun. I appreciate it thank you very much thank you for asking me to chat. Welcome. (coughs) Thank you for listening to Fear Less Do More. All of our guests come from a diverse range of backgrounds but they all share a common drive to face their fears, take action and create meaningful impact. If you've enjoyed this episode of our podcast, please follow us at Square One Law on Instagram and LinkedIn and share the content with your friends, family and networks. Thank you and see you again on our next episode.